I'm Trafika Kirchhoff, Assistant Curator of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the DIA. Like many of you, I have spent the last several weeks at home under the stay-at-home order in response to COVID-19. I feel fortunate to have been able to work from home during this crisis, and I'm thankful to all of the essential workers who have made that possible. Spending so much time in my apartment has me thinking of the ways that our surroundings can retain memories offer comfort or strengthen our resolve during difficult times. A quilt painstakingly stitched by a grandmother, a treasured book from childhood or a family heirloom passed down through generations, a piece of jewelry once worn by someone close to us. As a curator of sculpture and decorative arts, I trace the intertwined stories of objects, people and communities. The personal significance of things that populate my own home remind me of some of my favorite works in the DIA and their stories. Two steel armors for knightly sport, better known as the tournament, have inhabited the DIA since 1948. Before they arrived in Detroit, these two armors were displayed alongside each other for over 330 years in the collections of the Vetten family the ruling dynasty of the German state of Saxony, once a powerful principality in its own right, based in the city of Dresden. There, these armors became heirlooms that recalled the memories and knightly deeds of past princes and members of their courts. One of these armors is defined by its streamlined appearance. Though it was forged during the 1580s, its clean lines are startlingly modern. This armor was made by members of the von Speyer workshop, Wolf or Peta, or their contemporary, Wolf Peppinghorn, for tournament contests on horseback. Elements of the armor, such as the helmet, right arm, and leg defenses, were used for the Renin, a form of joust whose mounted participants charged toward one another with relatively sharp lances in order to score points by striking or unhorsing their opponent. In the DIA armor, these elements are combined with elements such as the flaring defense for the left elbow designed for the free tournament, a mounted mock battle with blunted swords and lances that could include dozens of participants and last up to two hours. Though the armor now appears stark, its hard polished steel surfaces would have been enlivened with luxurious materials during its working life as we can see in a print from 1624, which depicts a jouster wearing a skirt of patterned fabric, perhaps velvet, and crowned with a spray of ostrich plumes. Despite its expensive and innovative marriage of fashion and defensive technology, this armor was not made for the prince electors who ruled Saxony and whose votes were crucial to the election of the Holy Roman emperors who led Central Europe at this time. Instead, this armor was one of at least 35 tournament armors, some brightly polished, others blackened with paint, that were lent out to members of the Saxon court or visitors, and then returned to the Vetten family arsenal. Like a modern set of football pads or other sporting equipment, these armors protected successive generations of wearers until their retirement after their last tournament in 1719. When not in use, they hung in the Saxon armory at Dresden in a rhythmic installation of alternating blackened and shining steel armors. The tournament armors were made during the lifetime of Prince Elector Christian I of Saxony. Both Christian and his father, Elector Augustus I, were known for their enthusiastic participation in knightly sports as well as their patronage of art and architecture, especially in the Italian Renaissance style. This portrait bust, now on view in Dresden's old master painting and sculpture galleries, was completed by Carlo de Cesare del Palagio just after Christian's untimely death in 1591. It represents the prince in fashionably etched and engraved armor. 
Indeed, Christian was a prolific patron of armorers, working both in Saxony and in luxury armor-making centers like Augsburg. One such luxury armor forged in Augsburg now also lives here in Detroit. This armor, at once defensive equipment and high fashion, is decorated with botanical designs that were etched into the steel with acid. The elegantly curving patterns were gilded and their golden forms stand out against the iridescent blue surface of the steel. This deep, rich blue was achieved by slowly heating the armor to a precise temperature at which the metal blooms with a colorful and durable patina. This armor was designed for another form of tournament, a contest fought on foot by two knights separated by a waist-high barrier. This is why it encases only the upper part of the body, leaving the legs free. It was ordered as part of a set of 12 such armors, a kind of wardrobe in steel, by Sophie of Brandenburg, Christian's wife, from the armorer Anton Peffenhäuser. Peffenhäuser was among the last in a long line of exceptional armorers from Augsburg, whose artistry earned them fame throughout Europe. He signed this wearable artwork with his maker's mark, three striding legs radiating outward from a central wheel. Christian had ordered several armors from Pfeffenhäuser during the 1580s, both before and after he inherited leadership of Saxony following his father's death in 1586. In 1591, Sophie ordered the set of 12 sumptuous blued and gilt armors for the tournament on foot as a princely gift for her husband, to whom she planned to present them during the court's Christmas festivities. However, Christian's unexpected death in September of that year meant that he was never able to enjoy the beautiful gift that his wife had commissioned. Despite this tragedy, Peffenhäuser delivered the armors to the Saxon court, where they were installed in a place of honor within the armory of the Vettin family. There, like a family photo, its form recalled Christian's presence and evoked his memories for his wife, his son, and their courtiers and descendants. The Dresden armory and stables, which Christian had rebuilt, were equipped with a ramp down which contestants could ride directly into the tournament arena. They were both an active storehouse for equipment used in nightly sport and a venue for display whose installations of armors and portraits of Vettin family members anticipated the first museums. In this space, Christian's armors were proudly displayed Behind them, on the walls of the armory, the jousting armors used by his courtiers were installed in alternating ranks of black and white, as if attending the prince. The armors of the Vettin prince electors and their court remained in this space until the 1720s, when the Saxon collections of art, scientific materials, and other artifacts underwent a reconceptualization informed by Enlightenment ideas that shaped modern museums. By 1832, the armors were part of the new Royal Historical Museum of Dresden. And though their places of display changed, they remained together throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. Following the First World War, the Historical Museum sold part of its collection, considered duplicates. And these two armors, once parts of large sets of similar artworks, were purchased by the American newspaper baron, William Randolph Hearst. They arrived in Detroit in 1948 as loans from Hearst, and in 1953, his foundation gifted them to the DIA. Though the spaces they inhabit and the viewers who encounter them have changed, these artworks have remained together for over three centuries. In Detroit, as in Dresden, the armors have become part of the lived experiences of generations of museum visitors. Thus, the armors persist as objects of memory that recall the nightly sport and shining splendor of the past while forging new layers of meaning for those who encounter them in the Great Hall. The stories of these objects parallel the stories of objects with which we interact in our own lives. A treasured wedding ring or dress that is cherished as it is passed down from grandmother to mother to daughter a storied hunting rifle handed down from grandfather to father to grandson, 
the memories and facets of individual identities that settle onto these things with each use, each passing year, each new generation, are not so different from those that enshroud the DIA's Saxon armor in meaning. I look forward to a time when we can once again come together in the museum to explore dynamic artworks like these and to form new memories together. <laughs>